So welcome back. Um, I would like to talk with you tonight and uh, about equanimity. This is a very fundamental experience and factor of awakening in Buddhism. And uh, the Buddha did not have a monopoly on equanimity. It's not unique to that tradition. So I'd like to spend some minutes here exploring with you what is equanimity and why does it matter, including some of the interesting implications uh, of equanimity in terms of our own brain, and then open it up for some discussion. Uh, we'll manage the discussion through what's come in in the chat and both to me directly or perhaps to the group altogether. And I'd like to call on a, at least one person, maybe two or three, uh, to get their voices into the group. And I'm trying to balance here, uh, moving through a lot of questions, but also giving uh, some individuals a chance to talk, kind of work our way through this. Uh, so you ready for this? Uh, I'll end very, very close to half past the hour. Then as I mentioned, we'll take a extremely short little break Wave at each other if you want. Uh, those who can leave, can leave. And those who stick around, I will then put you in the Zoom platform into groups of uh, four or three or four people uh, for about 20 minutes, which will then end automatically. And uh, then that will be the end of the evening. Okay, that's the basic plan. So equanimity. Uh, equanimity is distinct from calm. Calm or tranquility is not having reactions. That's pretty useful. And in the Buddhist seven factors of awakening, tranquility is one of those factors. And you can see an appreciation for tranquility of body and mind and thought and deed running throughout the Buddhist tradition. And you can certainly see that appreciation in other traditions as well, including in modern times as an antidote to the ways in which we tend to have a kind of frenetic, fast-paced, multitasking, bombarded with you know, <laughs> media and distractions of one kind or another. All right, there's a, we need a place of calm. I think of calm as a kind of refuge. It's just quiet, right? Equanimity, which is also listed among the seven factors of awakening as distinct from tranquility is in a way more fundamental. If tranquility or calm or relaxation is not having reactions, equanimity is not reacting to our reactions. So it is fundamentally a vaster and more profound refuge. And in some sense, achievement in our own personal practice to gradually cultivate equanimity. I want to give you two examples um, for myself. As you uh, probably know, uh, in Buddhist psychology, there's an emphasis on what in modern psychology could be called the hedonic tones of experience, routinely translated as feeling tones of experience, even though they're not about emotion per se. The sense of experiences as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. These are the classic hedonic tones, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We like this, we don't like that, we don't care about that, right? Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Uh, personally, I think that there is uh, plausibly the emergence in recent neurobiological evolution over the last million or a couple million years of a fourth hedonic tone that's meaningfully distinct from the other three, the sense of things as relational. Uh, heartfelt. And um, it's the distinction between uh, wanting to move towards something because it's pleasant, wanting to move away from something because it's unpleasant, or to fight with it because it's unpleasant, or the sense of wanting to abide in relationship with something. For me, those are distinct. That said, I'm going to stay inside the frame of classic Buddhism here when I talk about equanimity. So, some things are pleasant, we like them. Some things are unpleasant, we don't like them. Interestingly, in the brain, in some of the deep motivational systems of the brain, in a part of it called the basal ganglia, there are two basal ganglia. Ganglia are little nodes or multiple nodes. So this is an important kind of complicated system, sits on top of the uh, 
brainstem, the lower portions of it, it's so fundamental, the basal ganglia to, a, to our motivation that even simpler uh, creatures such as crocodiles, uh, large complex reptiles, also have the beginnings of basal ganglia themselves, which are really elaborated in the mammals, uh, of which, of course, we're, we're among. Well, deep down in the basal ganglia are nodes in a part of it called the ventral, which means lower, striatum, which is also called the nucleus accumbens. There will be no midterm, fear not, all right? But deep down in these motivational centers in our brain are little nodes that like this or dislike that. And very importantly, there are, are there are other distinct little nodes, like a cubic millimeter, maybe a little bigger, uh, deep down there in the brain that want what is pleasurable and don't want what is unpleasant. So you see the distinction, the decoupling of liking and wanting. This means that deep down inside us, we can enjoy the wholesome pleasures of life without necessarily getting caught up in addictive craving or drivenness or attachment or pursuit or possessiveness toward them. It also means that we have the capability of being with what hurts, being with sorrow for others, being very concerned about the state of the world today, being morally outraged at injustice, uh, you know, not liking the fact that our tooth hurts or our shoes are too tight. We can not like things that are unpleasant without needing to go to war with them, without fighting with them or fleeing from them or having aversion toward them. This is wonderfully freeing. And you find a description of this kind of freedom, which is conferred by equanimity, a kind of distinction between liking and wanting or disliking and wanting not. Um, this distinction is also found in the Buddhist chain of dependent origination, which arguably is more like a network than a chain. But in any case, there's this critically important sequence that is very relevant for our psychology in which there's a movement identified by the Buddha uh, that happens to us all the time in our experiences, where there's what is called contact or in modern parlance, probably we would call a stimulus, the, the beginning of a perception of something. And then the sense of its feeling tone, right? So there, there's a movement from contact to feeling tone, the hedonic tone, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And then possibly a movement into craving and then even more kind of built out clinging and then dot, 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 suffering. So you see this sequence, right? There you are. Something happens, contact. Second, there's that kind of early appraisal of it and early sense of it. Do I like it? Do I dislike it? Meh. Or, you know, am I indifferent to it? And uh, move along, move along, you know, look for something else. Uh, and then, I really want it if it feels good or ugh, I don't like it. I want it to go away if it doesn't feel good. Right there in that space between the hedonic tone, which is very natural, which are normally arises, and the movement into craving, in that space, we can put increasingly a kind of shock absorber. And that shock absorber is equanimity. Uh, this space has been identified and appreciated by others. I think of the poignant, haunting, profound work of Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, who talked about this fundamental uh, space between stimulus and response, and in that space is our freedom. Um, I think about uh, other people who uh, have been prepared to bear witness to terrible things in life without having hatred invade them. Uh, I can think of people who can enjoy pleasures and they are what they are without getting caught up in addiction for them. So we have these examples around us all over the place. And how can we develop this ourselves? Uh, I want to give you a couple of kind of very down to earth examples. My, you know, for me, I grew up in Los Angeles and I don't really like it when it's hot. Uh, I 
it feels stuffy. I, you know, I don't like it. So it's unpleasant for me. Now, other people, like my wife, they like it when it's hot. But me, I don't know. I don't like it particularly. And I was sitting uh, actually in uh, a me our meditation group uh, back in the day when we met in a physical building rather than an online virtual building, as it were. And it was hot. It was really hot. I didn't like it. But it, I noticed that it didn't bother me. Ah, it was unpleasant. I didn't like it, but it didn't bother me. I wasn't upset about it. Wow, right there, mm, a teaching of equanimity. So you might think about your own experience. Are there things in your own life, bringing it real, bringing it down to earth for yourself, where you too can experience certain aspects of equanimity? Um, for example, there might be things in your life that you really don't like. They're unpleasant for you. Certain noises or maybe, um, you know, temperature. Uh, maybe you feel hungry. You'd like to get some food. Maybe you feel a little thirsty. Maybe there are people, this is where it gets really interesting, who are, you know, they're not that, <laughs> they're unpleasant maybe to be around. But deep down, you're not upset about it. You might casually, sure, prefer something different, but it doesn't bother you. You're not upset. You're not tipping into any kind of drivenness or resisting of what's happening simply because you, d you don't like it. It helps to do this with things that are mild. You know, it was mildly hot. I, I wasn't in a furnace. I can imagine that I might really, really not like it. And then it would bother me. But, you know, start with something simple, start with something mild. So you can have a feeling for, oh, this spaciousness, this shock absorber, this non-reactivity to whatever is arising in the mind. Stuff arises in the mind uh, and it will keep arising in the mind basically as long as we live. Uh, the Buddha reported um, experiencing pain. Um, I, I suspect as well he experienced pleasure. Uh, but, you know, we can cultivate a non-reactivity to what is appearing in the mind. All right. Different kind of example. Um, you probably had a thing where, I don't know why, I use cookies. I like cookies. Uh, I made some really good almond flour cookies recently. It's very, very nutritious, gluten-free. Anyway, so, um, you know, you, you like the cookie. Tastes good. Cookie's nice. But you're okay if you don't have another cookie. You like it. Uh, but you don't feel, oh, my cookie. <laughs> cookie monster. I must have cookie. You, you don't feel that. You're okay with it. In that space is equanimity. Um, so how do we cultivate equanimity authentically? which is not numbness. In other words, there's a, it's, it's, it's really profound. Equanimity has a fundamental spaciousness. There is an allowing of our experiences. There is an accepting of them with a non-reactivity to them. In other words, we are preserving a fundamental freedom in relationship to our experiences. And that makes all the difference in the world. So, what are some of the ways that we can cultivate equanimity uh, and uh, resort to equanimity, uh, even in trying circumstances, even now in, you know, amidst essentially a plague moving through the whole world? So several ways to have states of equanimity and over time cultivate trait equanimity. One is to repeatedly internalize the felt sense of needs met enough in the moment. As we repeatedly internalize that, which I was doing with you in the meditation, I was focusing on peace, contentment, and love, which uh, we experience when, at least in the present, in the present, there is an enoughness of safety, peacefulness, in the present, there is an enoughness of satisfaction, thus contentment. And in the present, in the present, there is an enoughness of connection. Our three major needs, like any other animal, for safety, satisfaction, and connection, very broadly defined. So when you have those opportunities, 
to authentically experience uh, a sense of calm strength, a sense of relaxation as you breathe, a sense of being protected, a sense of others who are supportive of you. So you can relax a little, you can lower your guard a little bit, you can let go of feeling that you're at war with the world, for example, when there is, in other words, an authentic opportunity to feel at least a little bit of safety so that unnecessary anxiety, unnecessary bracing and guarding can fall away. Oh boy, oh, open into that relief authentically. You can still be aware of potential dangers. You can still keep your eye on the traffic in front of you, the road in front of you as you drive, while feeling in the present and still in the present and still, ah, that you're basically all right, right now. And so you can internalize different aspects of feeling safe with associations broadly to peacefulness. You can do that as well with satisfaction. Contentment, I think, is a really beautiful, nuanced experience to have a feeling for, knowing that much as uh, while we feel safe, we can still be attentive to threats and we can still manage them in various ways while feeling peaceful in our core. In much the same way with a sense of contentment in our core, a sense of fulfillment or satisfaction, accomplishment, uh, gratitude, thankfulness, you know, in our core, we can still pursue gain, uh, goals. We could still be ambitious. We could still try to accomplish things. Uh, I just finished a book and I got another one banging around inside my mind. You know, then I think I actually will be done this next one on relationships. So it's okay. You can pursue stuff. But deep down inside, can we feel contented already? Right? And similarly, as we repeatedly internalize the felt sense of being um, connected with others, that our heart is warm, our heart is open, that there's courage even in our heart. We can see clearly, uh, we can stand up for others and stand up against others as need be without letting hatred poison our heart. Um, as we rest in that felt sense again and again, you gradually hardwire this unshakable core of resilience, which is um, you know, kind of the entry into equanimity deep in the fabric of your being. So that's one suggestion and that's available to us even amidst times of challenge, you know, when we feel in the moment some sense broadly of peacefulness or contentment or love or all mingling together, as maybe you experience in the meditation, be like a sponge. Receive it into yourself. Give yourself over to it. Get a sense of acquiring traits of peacefulness, contentment, and love woven into your being. That's a suggestion. A second suggestion, including in the moment when we're trigger, say, when there's something very unpleasant or very pleasant around us, try to widen out to the whole. There's a lot of really interesting brain science that emphasizes, as, as I explore in, in my book, Neurodharma, especially the chapters on wholeness and allness, there's a lot of very interesting neuroscience that when, for example, we get a sense of anything as a whole, there you are in the moment, you know, when we're not equanimous, <laughs> we're glued to the object. We're chasing the pleasure or we're fighting with the pain, we're stuck to it. Or when we're thinking about something that happened in a relationship, we're rewinding a conversation again and again and again, or what I should have said or what I wished I said, you know, we're stimulus bound in a sense. And the Buddha used a very pointed metaphor of a dog chained to a post. Yeah, the chain gives that dog a little bit of freedom of movement, but fundamentally the, ch the dog is attached to the post, the post being that stimulus, that pain or pleasure uh, or interpersonal issue that we're preoccupied with. We're, we're caught up in the part, or to put it a little differently, we're caught up in the figure. And what equanimity helps us do and, and what, how we can help ourselves become equanimous is have more of a sense of the ground. What is the sky in which the storm cloud is passing? What is the ground in which the figure of what is pleasant, unpleasant, or you know, relational is occurring? 
right? What is the field? Or to use a certain kind of a metaphor that just speaks to me, I don't know why, um, it's as if the emotional reaction that has suffering baked into it is like a certain spike coming up out of the pond, a certain ripple, you know, rising up out of the pond. And uh, a way we can help ourselves become more equanimous is to have more of a feeling of the pond altogether, the surface altogether, or psychologically, to move more into a sense of spaciousness of awareness. As soon as we do that, we, the intensity, the compelling quality of that particular stimulus, pleasant, unpleasant, heartfelt or neutral, starts to fade as whoosh, we go more out into the hole. Similarly, if you look around, imagine a bird's eye perspective, a panoramic view, or you move the gaze up to the horizon and out, that too helps to calm us down and helps us uh, move more into a sense of equanimity. That's really useful. And then I'll maybe offer one more suggestion uh, and then we'll kind of open it up for situations, discussion, how to practice with this, okay? So I've talked about the cultivation of a kind of felt sense that you can take refuge in and gradually colors your consciousness and you can return to more readily in which there's an okayness, there's an enoughness of peace, contentment, and love. Second, I've talked about going into the whole, moving out into the field, bird's eye view, a sense of everything as a whole, you know, all the different threads in the fabric of the particular situation, you know, kind of unknotting those threads, moving out into the sense of the whole. That's really helpful. The third, again, neurologically grounded, really effective thing to do, amazingly, is to come right into the present. So much of our craving and suffering is caught up with what scientists call mental time travel. We're preoccupied with the past or preoccupied with the future. Just, you can watch yourself. You go, we go into these little mini movies that are, you know, reviewing the past, the things that happen, our take on it, or we're imagining different potential things in the future. There's a place for that. Sometimes we need to understand the past. Sometimes we need to debrief it. We need to learn from the past. That's really important. Um, but, uh, and we, it's helpful to plan for the future. I'm a planner, you know, I think about the future. I, I like imagining different fun things to do. I like trying to, you know, analyze my situations and figure out a better way to approach them. All right, there's a place for that. But a lot of our issues uh, inherently involve mental time travel. And so when we come really into the present, in the present, it's okay. It just kind of, grounds us out. We're right in the present. And in, the, in my book, Neurodharma, in the chapter on receiving nowness, I talk about some of the ways this is really useful. I want to tell you a quick little story here that for me is a radical example of being in the present. I'm still working on this kind of, uh, you know, present-mindedness uh, myself, and then I'll open it up for some questions and discussion and comments. Okay, so true story. Uh, a monk in Southeast Asia living in essentially poverty in a very uh, poor part, I think, of Thailand, uh, had a tooth, a really serious toothache. And it was becoming increasingly clear that he needed to have his tooth pulled. There wasn't really access to dentistry in that part of, you know, the, the rural setting he was in. So his choice was either uh, just live with tremendous pain or pull the tooth himself. And so he actually did pull the tooth himself. And then someone was asking him about it. How did you stand it? Weren't you, wasn't it horrible just thinking that you were going to do this and, you know, how much pain it would be and how did you do it? He said, well, it was like this. Uh, I knew that I was going to go to the garden shed I, by the way, trigger warning, if any of you have big issues with dentistry, you know, <laughs> I won't be really graphic here, but you can imagine it. So anyway, he said, I knew I, my plan was to go to the garden shed and get a pliers and use the pliers to pull my tooth. And so I was walking to the shed and 
as my left foot was lifting, there was no pain. There, there was, you know, I, there was no extreme pain. As, my, as I planted my left foot, there was no extreme pain. As I lifted my right foot, as I walked to the shed, there was no pain. As I planted my right foot, there was no pain. As I took this breath, moving closer and closer to the shed, there was no pain. As I opened the door to the shed, there was no pain, right? Totally in the present, in the present, in the present, in the present, now, continuously. As I reached for the pliers, there was no pain. As I opened my mouth, there was no pain. I won't be too graphic here. As I placed the pliers on my tooth, there was no pain. As I closed the pliers and pulled, yes, there was pain. As I set the pliers down, the pain was fading. As I saw my tooth, the pain was leaving. As I turned to the door, there was no pain. As I opened the door, there was no pain. As I closed the door behind me, there was no pain. Breath after breath after breath after breath after that. Wow. So as someone who has spent a lot of time in the offices of various dentists, because because I have fragile teeth, um, I try to remember that story as a way to realize that in the present is our great refuge. There's great freedom in the present. And in the present, we can find a fundamental equanimity. Okay. So I want to open it up for you all. And um, uh, let's see here. I think what I'll do is respond to a couple of chat questions that have come in. And then I'll speak to uh, maybe call in on one or two people uh, who might have a, a comment or a question. Uh, when you do have a comment or question, I ask that you be specific and related to what we're talking about tonight. And you keep it fairly concise. And I'll try to do much the same. So, um, okay, great question. So, Emil, uh, wherever you are there, Emil. You, your question is, how do we display equanimity towards the loneliness that comes with today's self-isolation? Exactly right. So here we have in Emile's very astute question, there is loneliness. The Buddha distinguished between the first and second darts of life. The first darts are the inevitable, inescapable, natural uh, discomfort of mental or physical discomfort we experience from very subtle to completely overwhelming and agonizing. Then there are the reactions we have to it. These are the second, third, fourth, and fifth darts we throw ourselves. So what Emil is getting at is how do we uh, be with the first dart of loneliness, let's say, um, in a way that um, has equanimity in it. First, uh, as I think Dan Siegel has a clever jingle kind of saying, name it to tame it. Acknowledge it. Perhaps just note it to yourself, oh, lonely. Or, oh, loneliness turbocharged by feeling lonely as a child. Or loneliness with anger and feeling let down by my friends who are not reaching out to me. Whatever, you know, loneliness. And then it's interesting. As soon as you name the second dart, it becomes a first dart, right? So loneliness, getting really mad at myself, blaming myself for not being more popular. Oh, now I'm noting that, right? I don't have to react to my reaction to my reaction. You see, at some point you can stop reacting to the reaction to the reaction because you're going out, as I said, to the field of it all. That's really useful. So as soon as we start to be with it, in spaciousness. That's an example of that second major suggestion I was offering of trying to go wider and wider and wider. The wider the view, usually, the less the suffering. So, and part of that wider view is not about ignoring or pushing away what we're feeling. It's about widening the space in which we're experiencing it. So that's a major way to, for example, be with loneliness. Uh, with more equanimity. I do think that it's okay to draw on active processes of resourcing ourselves to support equanimity. 
So for example, let's suppose that loneliness arises, and then we do these initial practices of naming it, accepting it, going wider around it. And then maybe what we do is we deliberately bring in some compassion for ourselves, some kindness or sweetness for ourselves, which help us bear it better. We're, we're drawing on factors in effect of equanimity because maybe we're not yet enlightened. Um, we're not yet just profoundly equanimous always. Maybe we need to make a little bit of effort in the mind to support our equanimity. That's okay. It doesn't violate the equanimity. And through the internalization of the experience of self-compassion right there, we build up that internal trait of self-compassion which starts to you know, naturally mobilize, naturally come forward the next time we feel lonely. So that's perfectly okay too. And um, the last thing I'll just say about um, the experience of loneliness is another major method for equanimity. And it's one that's very trained in and developed in the Buddhist tradition. That's the method of insight. Insight into the nature of the experience. So for example, when we look at loneliness, we can start to unpack it. We can see that it's made of parts. There's the body sensation elements of loneliness, the emotional elements. There's often a cognitive element in it. Um, sometimes there's a movement or an action or posture or facial expression related to it. Uh, there might be desires woven in understandably into the loneliness, the longing. You see what I've done? I've kind of unpacked already five major threads of the experience of loneliness. The sensation element, the emotional element, the cognitive element, the um, desire element, the wanting element, the longing element, and then the behavioral element in loneliness. Well, as soon as you start to tease apart the threads of the experience, you begin to have insight into it. You also start to notice the dynamic nature of loneliness. It's it's changing quality it, so that at any moment, what we're experiencing is impermanent. It has that impermanence. And we also start to realize, oh, this experience of loneliness and the various threads that make up this experience of, of, of loneliness, let's say, are entwined with reality very broadly. They're grounded in my mammalian primate nature. It relates to my history. There are other factors of the present time. There's an epidemic that's sweeping through. We do need to do social distancing to protect others if, if, as well as perhaps ourselves. All right. So we start to see, in other words, in the technical sense, shunyata uh, in Sanskrit, the emptiness of what we're experiencing. It's existent. It's not void. Um, but in a certain sense, it's foamy as an experience. Loneliness is cloud-like. And we begin to have insight, vipassana, into the nature of our experiences, which is a very profound way to move into equanimity. And with repetition, we acquire trait vipassana, trait insight into emptiness, the recognition of the existent emptiness of our experiences. And actually, over time, you start to see the fullness that's shining through the threads. That's the fullness of the ground in which the threads of the tapestry of our consciousness uh, are occurring. And then more and more, you start to rest in and identify with that underlying ground, which uh, can, if potentially, start to edge into something that feels transpersonal. That was a pretty long answer, hopefully not overwhelming. Um, I'm thorough to a fault. Okay, <laughs> I wanna see if anybody has a question or a comment. You wanna raise your hand or just kind of scroll through the screens. I see Bill Schwartz. Okay, Bill, I'm gonna unmute you. Yeah, here you go. I've seen some um, in the chat a uh, mention of tinnitus. Tinnitus, yeah, hearing sound, yeah. That I, I, of course, I have, we, we don't know what it's like to be in each other's heads entirely. Yeah. But for myself, I have some tintiness and I have made friends with it over the years to the extent that I actually welcome it. It's a message. It's a, it's a transpersonal um, notification that, I, hey, you're alive. And I, that's the focus of my mm -hmm. uh, meditation. I, the breath is 
is there and that's good too, but we have some control over that. We don't have any control over our pulse. And then tintinus, for myself, it comes in rushes with the pulse. So I okay. think it's a marvelous gift. Oh, that's okay. Thank you, Bill. To do with it. Give yeah. some consideration to the sweetness of it. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. And for me, that's an example of um, going wider. So there are different ways to go wider. I saw a question or so about that. One is literally to look around, to see you know, the larger space. That's one way to go wider. Another way to go wider is to be more aware of awareness, to have more of a recognition without being all cosmic about it, just a recognition that, oh, there is awareness. Awareness is like a field of consciousness in which experiences are occurring, such as the tinnitus or tinnitus of that ringing in one's ears, which I have myself as well, I'd say at a mild to moderate level. Um, uh, it's really quite powerful to look around, to see the sky. I help myself in terms of going wider to imagine the longer reach of history, uh, the ways in which this moment in time is just a blink like that in the history of the universe. You look up at the stars, you have a sense of space. These are different ways to go wider. This is not about denying or minimizing what is here. It's about opening up to the context or field in which things are occurring. Okay, so let's see, we're okay on time. I wanna see if there are another question or two. I'm bouncing around, comment, question, short, sweet. Hey, Lily O'Brien, there you go, Lily. So happy to have calling you, Lily. Oh, thanks, Rick. Um, I was just, um, I wrote the question to you, but um, in, in terms of things like have, wanting that second cookie and that third cookie, yeah, um, or that second or third glass of wine, craving those kinds of things, um, I feel like when, when I'm feeling that way, I'm very much in the present. Like, I want it now. <laughs> so how, you know, how, how, what would be a good way to be equanimous about those kinds of things. Yeah. Are you able to step back from the desire and witness it with some disidentification? It's sort of like the difference between I want the cookie and there is wanting the cookie. Can you step back? No, I don't do that. Okay, that's, yeah. that, that would be the first. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thank you, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, yeah. Well, yeah, and that's really understandable. And, and with practice, what happens is, you know, we're completely identified with, I think of it as a movie, right? We want the cookie, right? I am, I want cookie. And right. then we go, okay, I know I want the cookie. I know that I can't have the cookie. I know it's frustrating. So I need to help myself not want the cookie so much, right? But now I'm back again. I want the cookie, right? And, but with practice, more and more, we start to develop that distancing, that disidentification. And um, a very powerful move, I think, is around labeling. Um, it's the distinction between I want cookie, I must have cookie. As soon as you say those words in your mind, you know what it feels like, right? But that's different from, oh, there is desire for the cookie. Uh, Sweet Lily, wonderful Lily, Lily wants a cookie. What a pity. It's not good for Lily to have the fifth cookie. You know, she's had four cookies already. Oh, okay, I'm kidding, but maybe just one cookie already. Uh, and, uh, but it, there's a sense of distancing. And you can even actually, these are kind of classic psychotherapeutic techniques. You start to be, you, you start to characterize the parts of yourself. They're included, right? And they're not shamed. This is very important. They're not shamed. They're not loathed. They're not abandoned or rejected. While on the other hand, there's a kind of cultivation of a certain amused accept, acceptance of these parts while also regulating yourself. And, and a common metaphor is to think of these desires, let's say, as like puppies in your mind, <laughs> you know, puppies. They want what they want and they're all running around. If you get angry at the puppy or you hurt the puppy, that's not good because also the puppy's part of you. On the other hand, 
there's a cultivation of a wisdom inside oneself. Like puppies, I know you want that. You can't have that. You know, you can't make a mess on the floor. You need to come over here. You can't run around in front of the buses. You got to come back. You know, we kind of regulate the puppies of our mind. That's very important. So there's this, there's, there's a shift of relationship. I see. Okay. I always wondered whether I should be thinking, well, what, you know, why do I want the cookie? What's the, what's the real reason? But maybe that's not the best way to go. There's a, I think sometimes there's a place for that. And sometimes, honestly, it just boils down to we've got a brain that likes carbohydrates and sweets, and that's the way it is. <laughs> You know, that puppy wants the bone every time. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what puppies do, right? We have like, uh, you know, I, yeah. I think that's a really useful thing. You know, Ajahn Chah, the teacher of teachers, uh, Jack Cornfield's teacher and others uh, no longer alive, he lived in a rural setting where there were apparently monkeys. And the monkeys would come in to the homes of the villagers and they would steal their food. And Ajahn Chah said, well, you know, do what you can, like close the window you know, so the monkey doesn't come on. But he said, you know, that's what monkeys do. That's what monkeys do. This is equanimity. We have passions, right? We have passions. We have lusts. We have angers. We have fears. We have feelings of loneliness and loss. We have all that, right? So what we can do, in a sense, to manage all that is try to shut it all down. And the Buddha, in his own history, was trained ascetically in a major shut-it-all-down approach. And his breakthrough was to realize that that was a dead end, because you can't shut it all down in this life. Um, yes, if you end the physical body, which the people in the Jain tradition at that time were, they thought that was a good thing, basically. And his, the Buddha's insight was, no, this is not the highest happiness. This is not liberation. Liberation means freedom. It means, in a sense, a shock absorber. So, and, and it's a very accepting way to orient. You know, we will have passions. Like I said, we will have angers and fears and, and desires and lusts and greeds. Those will arise gradually as we cultivate tranquility and virtue and concentration and wisdom, the three pillars of practice, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. Wisdom including vipassana, insight into the empty, transient, um, and incapable of permanent satisfaction of our experiences. You know, we get quieter. We get quieter. My, my mind has gotten quieter. My puppies, my, and age helps too. But anyway, you know, uh, puppies get more mellow. But, you know, then our happiness depends upon what our puppies are doing. We're, we're vulnerable. It's unreliable. But if gradually we shift our relationship to all the puppies running around, you know, the greedy puppies, the hungry puppies, the lonely puppies, the angry puppies, the freaked out puppies, when we gradually shift our relationship to them, that's how we can find the most fundamental and stable happiness and inner peace. What a beautiful teaching from the Buddha, you know? Thank you, Rick. I, I actually, I got it. And I, I really got an insight on that. Thank you so much. Oh, totally good. Totally good. So we're going to finish in a moment and I want to get better myself. I got to regulate my puppy. See, my, I got a puppy who would just love to hang out with you for hours. And sometimes it's our sweet puppies that also have to be regulated a little bit. They might get us into trouble. So I want to kind of end on time and end on close to time. So I want to say for myself, just before I unmute you all, that this was really sweet. And remember, we really can develop greater equanimity. And as we develop that equanimity inside ourselves, we become increasingly fearless, increasingly content, and increasingly rested in an unconditional love through which others come and go. <laughs> 